let's just uh, keep going here with uh, inverting the latent variable nature model. I'm going to just uh, go, there's a lot of detail here behind some of these equations. And, um, if this is something that interests you, I, I really recommend you read the, the journal publication. So I won't go into the details on deriving some of the equations. We'll land up with kind of the end point, and I think that's good enough coverage for this particular uh, class. So the approach that's typically followed is a two-step approach. We're going from Y desired, which we specify ourselves, and getting to tau desired. So in other words, we're going to get a vector that we want to achieve in the score space. And once we've got that, we've shown already in the first part of the class today how to get back to our X space. In this particular illustration here, our X space is actually divided up into two blocks. So it's a multi-block PLS, where we built XP and XMix, put those together and predicted Y when we built the model. Now when we go backwards, we go from Y to the T's, to the scores T, and then when we invert the scores, we use the multi-block PLS equations to get back to X mixture vector here and XP in both the settings. Okay, so I'm just going to state up here that the way that you calculate tau design is by using that formula up there. So Christiana Jekyll's paper and her PhD thesis goes into quite a bit of discussion on this formula, and there's a lot of interesting uh, information in there regarding null spaces and rank and so on. And, and it, uh, yeah, it, may, it is fascinating reading, even though I say it sounds like, it doesn't sound like I'm talking about null spaces and ranks, but there, there's a lot of useful information to understand about that inversion there. And then once you've got your tau desired, to go back to the x's, we just multiply uh, that tau desired by w star. And we do that for each block. You can, you can break it down on a block by block basis. So calculate the new process settings, calculate the new blend properties. Okay. But that's, remember this, what we're going to land up here is X mixture. It's going to tell us you need to use a mixture of materials with this sort of average viscosity, and this sort of average boiling point, and this sort of average density. Okay. It's not going to tell us which raw materials to use and in which ratio to combine them. So unfortunately, by using the X mixture matrix, it has improved our PLS model. We get better PLS models in, in those cases, but it's not very helpful from a model inversion point of view. When we go back from the scores to X mixture, it's going to just tell us what blend of properties to use, but not tell us which raw materials to blend and in which ratios to blend them. The process settings are, are helpful when we invert from tau desired back to the process settings. Sure, it will tell us what temperature and pressure to run our reactors with, but it won't, um, and, and, then, and that's what we want. But for, this is unfortunate here that, sure, this has improved our PLS model, but it's not helpful from a model inversion point of view. So, what, we're going to, what I'm going to hopefully end up showing you, or what I will end up showing you rather, is we're going to want to invert tau desired to the ratio vector this time, and to the process settings vector, but then we also want to, well, we also want to pick which particular rows from the D matrix should we use. We want to select ingredients <laughs> and assemble this matrix I. And I may pick uh, different ingredients from this D matrix and assemble this matrix I, and then my ratio vector down here will tell me in which proportion I should mix these ingredients to get that tau desired. Okay, so it's actually it's quite a complex problem if you think of it in that way. But not only do we want to know the process settings and the ratios, but there's this discrete element to the model inversion. We want to pick discrete rows from this database D over here. And it's not obvious how the system should pick out those rows in order to achieve this tau desired. Different raw materials multiplied by this ratio matrix, so R times I, will get you your mixture matrix, which will get you a tau desired. So it's a, it's a very non-linear problem and an integer problem as well. And there's what it is in optimization form. Okay, so it's a big mess from, an op from written as this form, but let's, let's break it down and take a look at what we're doing here. Okay, so 
like I said, we've skipped out a big chunk of work to get to this point, final point. I'm just going to land that by showing you the general optimization point, uh, general optimization formula, formulation for product development. And it goes as follows. We're saying, I want to achieve a certain Y desire. And the way I'm going to get to that Y desire is I'm going to predict a particular Y. And that prediction of Y is going to be a function of two sources of information. Or, sorry, three sources of information. It's going to be a function of which X properties I use to set my, my, my process. So XP is my process settings. The ratios with which I blend my raw material. And there's a third variable there that I, I really should have included that is which rows from this D matrix do I use? In other words, I'm going to choose particular rows from that D matrix to get to that optimum. Okay, so Y, y predicted is a function of my settings that I run my process at, the ratio with which I blend my raw materials with, and the particular raw materials I use in that blend. Okay, so I'm going to show you the equations for Y predicted further down here. So this is what I want, what I'm going to predict. Subtract the difference, that's my prediction error. So that's a vector over here. There's this W1 diagonal matrix in the middle, which just weights the different elements in this error differently. So usually, you'd start off with y, uh, W1 equal to the identity matrix. That just gets, says, I want to predict all my y's e equally well. So I don't, I don't have any preference on making sure the prediction error for, for the different y's. I just want all my predictions for y's to be small. And so this is nothing more than saying my errors, the sum of squares of my errors, if W1 is the identity matrix. If W1 is still a diagonal, but with different values on the diagonal, they're just increasing and decreasing the preference for minimizing that error. W2 is, a, is another weighting term multiplied by this summation. So this summation is the ratio of my raw materials times this value CI. So for every raw material I use, CI is the corresponding cost of that raw material. What does it cost me? Dollars per kilogram. So, uh, so on the next slide is, is some further nomenclature. So CI down over here is the cost per unit weight, dollars per kilogram for the I ingredient. And the ratio R U with which I use that ingredient. So this is nothing more than telling me the total cost of this recipe. I want to minimize that as well. Not only do I want to predict and get to my Y that I want really with small error, I also want to make sure that, that my recipe is not expensive. It's not, not going to cost me a lot of money to get to that, to that desired end point. Then I've got a third term over here, which brings in the integer component to this optimization problem. It says, sum up the number of raw materials I use. Okay, so DI, or delta I rather, is one if I use a raw material, and it's zero if I don't use the raw material. So the more raw materials I use, multiplied by a non-zero penalty up here, it's going to penalize me the more raw materials that I, I use. So I don't want a recipe where I use lots and lots of different raw materials. I'd like a recipe with as few raw materials as possible and with minimum cost. And I want to get to that prediction value as close as possible, uh, to get to my desired value as close as possible. So that's my objective function, the sum of those three terms. And then notice that your objective function isn't really a function of your search variables. It is a function of R nu, but in no way do we use X nu from the process settings in my objective function. So that has to come in somehow, and it comes in through the constraints. What we say is, the ideal mixing rule says, take my ratios R, multiply by my database D, and that's going to tell me the blend of my that mixture. So take my ratios that I'm going to finally end up searching for over here, multiply the database, it's going to give me my blended ratio, or my blended properties in X new, or my mixture properties. That's the first part. So X mix new is going to be really 
it's a, it's a combination of my ratios here and multiplied by my, my ingredients. I'm going to use this x mix mu further down over here. That's why it's just an intermediate calculation. So it's telling me my blended properties. I'm going to calculate my prediction of y by saying the scores mu tau mu times the C matrix. That's the standard equation for PLS. Y hat is equal to C times T. It's a Y prediction. But tau mu is a function of my process settings and my mixture settings. Okay. So now I can see where my search variables come into play. My process settings x mu coming over here, multiplied by the W stars to, or part of the W stars to get tau mu. Tau mu is also a function of my mixture settings, of my, my blend, sorry. Where my blend, x mix, is a function of the ratios. So my search variables over there, my ratios, come through this equation to calculate my blend mixture. It gets multiplied by W star and affects tau mu. And tau mu gets used in this equation to calculate Y predicted. So that's through a very long, complicated loop, my objective function absolutely is a function of the, the, the individual search variables. Two other very interesting and important constraints are that I want the SPE of that new observation and T squared for that new observation to be small. In particular, I want SPE to be as close to the model plane as possible. So I set that alpha to a very small value much smaller than the 95% limit. My T squared, I can often tolerate a pretty large T squared, so I'm happy to set T squared to be at right as high as the 95% limit. But I do want my new point to be as close to the model plane as possible. So SPE much smaller than alpha. And for those of you that take uh, the optimization course, you'd, you'd see that this choice of alpha is obviously flexible. So one thing you can often do with a lot of success it works very well, it's just to simply put SPE right up here in the objective function with its own weight, W4. Just say I just want to minimize SPE. In fact, you can even do that with T squared. So rather than constrain T squared to be smaller than the 95% limit, you can put it up in your objective function as well. And, but still leave, you might still want to leave this constraint here in, your, in the subject two section, but add it in so it can penalize as well. The, Final other constraints are the obvious ones. You want the sum of the ratios to add up to one. And you want to make sure that those ratios that are used, those values in R are between zero and one. So that's a standard constraint, it makes, it makes sense. And then finally, you have some integer variables here uh, that each raw material is either used or is not used. So that's where the delta comes from, delta I, one for every potential raw material. So this is a a big, big mixed integer non-linear programming problem. It's mixed integer coming from these constraints, uh, from this requirement that we either use or don't use raw materials, and that penalty term up there. It's non-linear, given the quadratic nature up here, given that t squared is a quadratic function of the scores, tau. Um, so it's an MINLP. I think we've gone through most of this terminology. Yes, C, the C matrix and W star, these are my POS model coefficients. T is my database. I think every, every one of the other ones will cover. So code that up into GANs or MATLAB or uh, whichever optimizer you, you prefer and uh, solve it. And, that's, and, and they, they do solve quite quickly. Those problems are not big problems by any means compared to the optimization problems that you guys in the control group typically solve. This is a pretty small problem and uh, usually solves by the way. So chapter three, Koji's thesis, this is the case study we're gonna look at here next. So he had his optimization, it's just, sorry, I skipped over this. His aim was not necessarily to design a new product, but his aim was to replace an existing raw material. One of the rubbers needed to be replaced in the recipe with a new rubber. And he didn't say why, that was the case, but that was the company's requirement. And it could be due to the company uh, maybe falling out with their supplier, or maybe the company was themselves supplying this raw material in the future instead of buying it from their competitor. Something's changed there that the company now wants to use a different rubber to the ones that they were using in the past. 
They want to maintain the final properties of that polymer blend in the Y matrix, and they want to minimize the raw material costs. Okay, and I, as I mentioned earlier here, we have no process settings in this particular case study because all previous work was done at the same process conditions. So that matrix XP falls away. So in his optimization, there were 30, 30 variables, 93 constraints, and when he used uh, integer variables in this optimization, he was using the SPD solving gaps. So having integer variables, for those of you that work with MI problems, it, it makes the problem hard. Right? So if they don't, it certainly not good to solve. So if you set W3 equals to zero in the objective function, so you, in other words, you don't penalize the number of raw materials that you use. You're willing to accept maybe a few more raw materials. So by turning W3 off, you actually take away the integer part of this optimization problem. You don't have this integer variable here anymore, the delta i for every raw material, because all you're penalizing is the total cost and your prediction error. Nowhere else are there integer variables in the constraints. So taking away just that W3 <coughs> set makes this an NLP rather than an MI NLP. So let's take a look at some of the results that Cody was able to achieve here. Here's the original product and its properties, and then the second set of uh, dopamines here represent the new product that came out of the formulation. So the original product had these particular properties, Y1 up to Y7. Again, we don't know what these variables are, but they're likely the usual variables that characterize the polymer. That was what our, our y, uh, in, our, in our objective function, that vector over there would be y desired, y dx. Okay. Also, the original recipe, these are the current ratios. 54% of rubber 5, 44% of oil 1, 1% of polypropylene number 4. And the cost, I think these are in yen, 430, 94.5 yen per, per kilogram, and 95 per kilogram for polypropylene 4. So you can calculate the cost by multiplying it by the corresponding ratio and summing up. So that, that would get you the total cost for the existing column. So the, the unit cost is 277.4 yen for the existing um, mixture. Solve it using NLP. So in this particular example, uh, Koji turned off the W3 term, so he, he was not interested in penalizing the number of raw materials. But what was interesting is to take a look at the solution. So this is the solution of R nu over here. And this first row in the red box, the estimated row, represents In the, in the objective function, it would represent y predicted. So this is what the PLS model predicts as what you'll get as your y variable. Okay. So notice how very similar these predictions are from the PLS model to what the company actually wanted. So y3, what they wanted, 0.5, they achieved. The model said you're going to get 0.48. Y4, 0.9, the model says you're going to get 1. Okay. And then this value over here, this 0.478, represents this first term in the objective function. So it's your prediction error transpose times W1 uh, times your prediction error again. If you, if you take your final result and you calculate the mixture ratio, which the optimization gives you, with the corresponding costs for those uh, particular elements used in the blend, you can see that the new cost is is reduced. So on a per kilogram basis, let's say, that new polymer blend would cost you less money. And the other thing that's new, you know, that's interesting, is remember the company wanted to eliminate rubber five from the <coughs> original recipe. The optimization goes and picks rubber one, rubber two, as well as rubber new one. Rubber new one was a new rubber that had never been used before by the company. So they had no idea about how its performance was, but it's available to select
from the mixed into, uh, from the from the NLP because it appears here in the D matrix as one potential rubber to choose from. So this D matrix was assembled by the company, not just based on all the previous ingredients that they used, but also new potential ingredients that they've never used before. So it's available for selection by the optimization problem. So coming down here, this new rubber is introduced that they've never used before. They had used rubber one and rubber two. They used oil one and polypropylene four. Those are both ingredients from the previous recipe. But the new recipe calls for eliminating rubber five and replacing it with rubber one, two, and new rubber one. Mitsubishi then took these particular settings and there was definitely an element of skepticism there. They did not think that this would work um, but they did implement it, and their Y values that they calculated or that they achieved from that new setting are those given in the second row. So observed is the actual values as calculated by Mitsubishi, and notice that those are actually much closer to the uh, required target than, um, than even the PLS model's prediction. So they got right to target within that single uh, within that single run. This slide is very small and probably is even smaller than if you printed out the notes on the fourth page. But what the purpose of this uh, discussion here isn't so much that you can actually see the numbers, but more just to talk about the different weighting function in the objective. So if we go back up here to the objective function, we can adjust W1 and put values greater than one or smaller than one on the diagonal and treat them. We can change W2 and W3 and up weight or down weight. Okay. And every time you do that, you, you choose a new set of Ws, a new set of weights, and resolve, you're going to get a slightly different solution. You're going to get a different X new, a different set of ratios, and, and perhaps different rubbers and polypropylenes and oils to use. And a different cost, of, obviously, as well for that, for that brand. So this is very helpful because it gives you solutions with different characteristics. So here's four particular cases. You don't have to go through the, the data table. But what's interesting is that this first solution was a cheaper blend. If you calculate the costs and add them up, it's much. It's a lower cost than, than even uh, these two, than, than this implemented solution. The implemented solution by Mitsubishi gave a cost of 267. This first alternative uses products, or raw materials rather, that are cheaper overall, but your prediction error of Y is, is poorer. So you're not able to achieve the targets at Y as, as good as the other solution that was recommended by Koji on the previous page. But that's interesting, because this company can go make a second grade of the product for a market that's not prepared to pay so much. Okay, so it's no different to going to Fortino's versus no frills. You can often get similar products but different levels of quality. Companies do this all the time. They'll create one product for one market and then differentiate it slightly by offering a cheaper version of slightly less, of slightly lower quality to a different market. So this gives them that opportunity. They can go create a raw material, they can go blend raw materials, cheaper cost, but not quite at the targeted values of the, of the quality specification. Case two and three were closer to target than any of the other predictions, but they cost more. So the raw materials are more costly and you can get closer to target. The final solution here, very similar to the one that was actually implemented and recommended on the previous slide, but uses a totally different set of raw material, polypropylene 3. It uses oil 1, that's the same as before, but it, and, and rubber 3, which wasn't used before. So rubber 3 and polypropylene 3, these are totally uh, different raw materials and can get you roughly in the same order of, of prediction accuracy. That's very useful if, let's say, rubber 3 and polypropylene 3 come from different suppliers. One supplier might be more reliable than the other, and so if you can get to the same prediction accuracy, I'd, I'd go any day with a supplier that's more, more stable and more reliable, okay, if it's roughly of the same cost. So this is nice that you can trade off 
you don't just get one solution here. You can get a multiple number of solutions, each with slightly different trade-offs and leaving you to pick one that suits your needs. Okay, so let's just, uh, I just want to summarize this section on the optimization approach. By using the single large optimizer, we actually eliminate this two-step. We don't need to go from Y desired to town desired or T desired and then from T desired back to XQ. We can get there in one go. This optimization step just asks you to select X mu and R mu, so these are our search variables, by giving what our target is. So we're basically going from Y directly to X. We're not bypassing the scores or eliminating them, certainly the scores are here. It's right here as a constraint, an equality constraint in our model. So we're not eliminating them, we just don't do it as two separate steps. I guess it would be the equivalent of like a principal component regression. It's a two-step. You go from PCA to multiple linear regression. Or you can use PLS that goes straight from your X to your Y. This would be the same thing, we're just doing it backwards. So instead of going from Y to tau and from tau to X, we can just go from Y to X, but still calculate those scores we're telling you. The other advantage of using this is that you can have box-like constraints on um, Y desired, so rather than forcing Y desired to be exactly at these particular numbers, many times companies don't have their specifications like that. Uh, most of the companies I've dealt with, their specifications are upper and lower limits. They say, I don't mind what you produce as long as my Y is within these upper and lower bounds. Okay? So that, that gives us some freedom because we can put those upper and lower bound constraints in in our optimization in, in the subject two section. Uh, the W1 matrix is useful because it allows us to trade off some of the Ys against each other. You might be more interested in getting a, a higher prediction accuracy on some Ys over the others. Cost of ingredients and recipe complex, uh, complexity is handled. We don't get that if we do this two-step approach. We, we lose that um, ability to handle those constraints. I didn't cover this in the, in the case study, but sometimes and so many of the examples I've seen, the x space variables are actually integer variables. So sometimes the x space variables are my use reactor A or reactor B, okay? Or it's um, use catalyst A or catalyst B. So when you invert your model, when you go from tau desire back to x here, if you've got integer variables in x, you kind of just, you're hoping that you're gonna get an x that's either close to zero or one. But if you've got it in an optimization framework like this, you can enforce that constraint, that, x, that certain x's are actually integer variables. Rather than hoping that the optimization is going to come close to either a zero or a one. <coughs> um, which else have we covered here? Yeah, so we we'll make the same product in different way. Actually, like I said earlier, most of the, the product development problems I see are actually of this type. They're not developing a totally new product. They're trying to make the same product in a different way, using different raw materials or cheaper ingredients and so on. Um, and then finally, one way that these models are very useful from an ongoing point of view is many times the company will, will they'll come up with a set of specifications. Let's say we're going to use 12.8% of rubber one, 37% of rubber two, and so on. But that's predicated on the fact that when you built that original database, that rubber one and rubber two and oil one had very particular properties. But your supplier is not able to ever provide for you on an ongoing basis those materials at exactly those conditions, right? So your suppliers are going to change their raw materials as well over time. So if you're getting in here, it's going to be slightly different. So periodically companies will re-optimize by using the new raw material properties from their supplier or if there's process measurements in, in that X matrix that are a little bit different from before, they'll keep re-optimizing to keep on target. So this is a very powerful approach. It's a little hard to set up and maybe wrap your head around from an optimization point of view, especially if optimization is not an area you've covered before, but it's uh, certainly very easily implemented by software once, once you've got it up there. Okay, any, any questions?
questions on that particular This uh, was another in, uh, interesting case study I thought to include, just on a visual perspective, uh, trying to optimize the appearance of a product. So June, uh, JMU's thesis in his last chapter, he describes this particular case study where these are panels that are injection molded, and the company wants a particular appearance for these panels. Obviously, they, they don't want these sort of wavy lines. This is a, a defective panel. What they're hoping for are process conditions that get a panel that looks pretty uniform. So they had a variety of panels available and images of those panels, digital images. So those digital images were taken and Jay extracted wavelet features for each image. So several wavelet features on each image like we, like we discussed in one of the previous classes and then he did a PCA on those wavelet features. I think there were 40 odd wavelet features extracted. Reduce that 40 dimensional space down to four dimensions, T1, T2, T3, T4 by doing a PCA. What was very interesting is that the PCA scores actually had an explanation. So negative T1 images were images with mostly flat, uniform appearance. Higher T1 values, they had more patterns. So the T1 direction was really just, was going from no patterns to some patterns. T2 was going from dots and very fine features. I think uh, the closest approximation doesn't come out very clearly here on the projector, but this panel has actually a lot of fine dots spread evenly around it. So that would be a low T2 image. And high T2s had more swirls and ripples. Negative T3 had mainly horizontal patterns, and T4 had mainly vertical streaking. Okay. So in his X, so that was can't just try to have your Y matrix here, your quality space. He had used the PCA on the wavelet features, and then the T1, T2, T3, T4 values actually became your become your Y variables. Okay. So to illustrate it, then your Y space would be the appearance features T1, T2, T3, and T4 from a PCA that's done separately. Your X space, he had 46 columns in X, and they were things like injection speed, the formulation settings, the positions of the clock, and um, the company for confidentiality coded those. This was actually a continuous variable, but they coded the various settings that they used as binary variables, so they, they created extra columns in X. So what you do then here in this case is that uh, Y desired is actually quite hard to specify because our Y desired is a set of features from a PCA matrix on wavelets, texture features. Okay, so it's very hard to say I want a T2 and a T1, T2, T3, T4 value of such and such. But what, once you have this interpretation for each of the scores, it, it makes it easier. The other thing that you can use to your advantage is you can go look at a previous image that is good, of desirable appearance, calculate its T1, T2, T3, T4 values, and use those as your Y desired or, or, or similar values. And then you run this backwards using the approach we've just discussed to find the injection speed, the formulation settings, and the clock positions that give you better appearance or more systematic Oh, sorry, more reliable and repeatable appearance of the type that you're looking for. And so that was an interesting way of getting to that uh, result, or, or modeling version of using the image data. Emily's uh, chapter in her thesis describes a product reformulation at, at uh, Quaker Foods in Peterborough. They, she followed the same objective function approach and there the objective was to maintain Y desire, to maintain the taste and the texture of the muffin. But there was also a, re, a reformulation there. Um, I'm not sure what this is, but there was this, in her thesis she called it AOI, an attribute of interest. So the company not only wants to maintain the taste and texture that they had before, there's this drive based on their marketing information that consumers don't want 
this AOI, whatever that might be. It could be trans fats or salt or something like that. You don't know. But let's say it's a, this AOI needs to be minimized, so that's added into your objective function as well in the optimization. You add terms to minimize the cost in there. And there was definitely, it's very undesirable to reformulate this recipe and land up with a recipe that has totally new set of ingredients that's weren't used before. So that, that's not, that's un, undesirable. So you can, you can penalize that effect as well. And then there's obviously certain constraints on the ingredients, how much flour and oil and so on can be added. So that's, that's a great chapter to read if you, if you have the time there. And what was interesting, it shows how the data set was growing over time. Remember I said right here at the beginning of this discussion that we can only really go ahead and do this model inversion if this new Y that we want has an SP that's below the limit from our, our, our previous operation. And I said, well, what if we do this uh, Y design and, and take, say, well, hang on, what you want us to create is really not within the scope of the previous product you made well, we don't just stop there and say, well, we give up. What we, what we can do is we still run the optimization. Okay, so coming back here to the optimization framework, what you'll say is, I'm still gonna run this optimization, but find me the solution, x nu, my process settings and my raw material ratios. And you're going to find that SP is right on the bound. So let's say you specify that alpha at the 95% level of SPE. You're going to find that optimization is going to find you the least, uh, find you the best x and ratios to use. But because you're asking for a new y, the y desired expect you're asking for a y that's so inconsistent with your previous product, it's totally expected that your solution for this optimization is going to be right at the constraints. And it's nine times out of ten, it's going to be at the SP. But because we constrain SP to be 95%, what it's going to find you is, is a recipe that's very unusual that you've not run before. You take that recipe, the X new values and, and the ratios and ingredients, and you, you run it in your process. And then you bring that new observation back and you rebuild your PLS model. And you may have to do that several times. So what Emily's work does, and Koji also shows an example where this matrix here, that N grows with time. As you get more and more information of these recipes that are kind of off at the extremes of your model space, you bring them in, rebuild the model, and then the second and third time you rebuild the model, that model now has knowledge of these new directions and these new um, requirements. So it does a better and better job of predicting the model of predicting the Y design. So you, you bootstrap your way along by bringing in information that you've learned from previous experimental runs until you get to your final Y design. Okay, and that's uh, Koji's, Koji's thesis actually, when he got the data set from Mitsubishi, they had a, a large, large database of previous experiments they tried. I think it was over 200 experiments to get to this new target point. What Koji shows he says, well, let's pretend we don't have all these experiments. So let's just start with a limited set of experiments. And he built his way up to get to Y design. And he showed that you could get to the final endpoint with a far fewer number of experiments than it took the company to do the original. And so, yes, he did have the full database of experiments. But he said, well, let's pretend we don't. Let's just take a limited subset and we can show that you can get to the endpoint much faster. Uh, the other thing is there's no reason why you can't do some batch data. So if we look back at this illustration here for X, you can easily add a block here where your X, one of your X blocks is the set of unfolded trajectories. Okay? And basically that's telling you what process settings, what uh, recipe ratios to use, but also what should be the shape of your trajectories to, to operate that batch. And that's, that's very interesting and there's some good results there in the Seuss's thesis and uh, Salvador's thesis. 